Hello and welcome to this video on ethnicity and educational achievement, internal factors. The internal factors we're going to consider are labelling and teacher racism, pupil identities, pupil responses and subcultures and institutional racism. By internal factors, we're here we are focusing on what goes on inside the classroom, inside the school, or inside the education system. Whereas if we were referring to external factors, as I do in a different video, we would be talking about what goes on outside of the classroom, of the school or college or the education system. Firstly, when thinking about labelling and teacher racism, Black pupils are often seen as aggressive and Asian pupils as passive. So we've looked before at the role that teacher labelling can play and how that label can be transmitted and students can uh, internalise that label and it can affect the way they behave. If that label is negative, it's going to have a negative impact on the student, the way they view themselves and the way they feel about education, which ultimately could lead to educational underachievement. Often in the UK, black pupils are seen as aggressive, and this is a, a racist view that some teachers might hold, just as you know, some teachers may believe Asian pupils as being passive or being quiet. And again, this would be a racist viewpoint. Teachers may teach pupils from ethnic minorities differently. They may interact with them differently, may talk to them differently, may respond to them differently if they have special needs or if they're looking for extra support. And again, this is going to have an impact on their outcomes at the end of the year or the end of the qualification. Looking at a particular piece of work by Gilborn and Udall in the year 2000, teachers were quicker to discipline black pupils they found. Teachers had racialized expectations, that is that they expected ethnic minority pupils to act differently. So when teachers were entering the classroom and they saw students from a black Asian minority ethnic background, they had a racialized expectation of what they could achieve and you know, how they were going to behave in the lesson. Black pupils in turn feel teachers underestimate them and pick on them. So they may feel somewhat hard done by, they may feel that they're being bullied, they may feel that they're being victimized. This may stem from teacher racism rather than pupils' actual behaviour. So the pupils might actually be behaving in a very normal fashion. There may be no differences in their behaviour between black Asian minority ethnic pupils and members of the white British majority, but it's the teacher's reaction, the teacher's innate racism that may be causing the issue here. Born and later Osler also found that black pupils are more likely to be sent out of class placed in pupil referral units, excluded or expelled. So if we think about all the different forms of punishment that schools sometimes use, it's often we found or they found that uh, black pupils or black age minority ethnic pupils are likely to be at the receiving end of these punishments or are more likely to receive more punishments than say members of the white British majority. As we know, there exists an A to C economy in our education system. Schools are desperate to try and get as many grades, uh, GCSE grades C and above, and so they will focus on those students who can get those grades. If you're getting the top grades, you might be allowed to do your own thing to a certain extent. If you're scoring D or below or E or below, that's going to cause problems and often you'll be ignored. If you're on that sort of C, D borderline, you often get a lot of support. And so this is what we call educational triage. Black pupils are more likely to be placed in the lowest streams due to teacher labelling and racism. So, as we know, secondary schools in particular stream, so there'll be top classes and bottom classes based on the perceived ability of each student. If they're really good at a subject or seem to be very good, they're placed in the top streams. If they are perceived as not being so good, they're often placed in the lower streams. And this can affect things like, you know, the grades they can get in some of their exams at GCSE. And, you know, what it would appear is that uh, what's making, what's driving these decisions is teacher racism. Foster found that black pupils were in lower sets because of their perceived behaviour rather than their academic ability. It does appear actually on a number of occasions that black pupils were doing as well as, if not better, than some white British majority pupils and yet uh, they were being placed in the lower streams. In terms of Asian pupils, Cecil Wright found teachers held ethnocentric views and saw British culture and standard English to be superior than, say, Asian culture or Asian dialects or languages. Teachers tended to assume that Asian pupils will have poor English, even though on many occasions, you know, these Asian pupils have been born in the UK, uh, maybe even their parents have been born in the UK and they speak English at home, and they may have a very good standard of written and spoken English, and yet the teachers were making assumptions about them based on their ethnicity.
Asian pupils often feel isolated when or if teachers show disapproval for their customs or mispronounce their names. So you know, sometimes teachers may um, you know, ignore certain practices or may not recognize um, certain you know, religious uh, celebrations that perhaps pupils from Asian backgrounds might be engaging in and this is seen as a dismissal and that's going to affect the self-esteem of Asian pupils but also um, if a teacher is mispronouncing your name regularly almost irrelevant of your um, ethnicity that's going to have an impact on the way you view yourself and the way you uh, think about education or the way you think about that teacher so uh, it's particularly pronounced for uh, Asian pupils and it prevents them from engaging fully. Ultimately, they're going to think to themselves, well, this isn't for me. The teacher clearly doesn't you know, care about me, isn't interested in me, can't even pronounce my name correctly, and therefore they may disengage and underperform. Heidi Merza did some interesting research with regards to teacher racism and argued that there were three different types of racist teachers. So she was looking at teachers and when they engaged in this racist behaviour, um, the form it took and what it looked like and how even teachers thought about it themselves. Firstly, she identified what she referred to as the colorblind teachers, and these were those who believed that all pupils are equal, but does not challenge raci racism he or she witnesses. So although they themselves may not be a racist or hold prejudiced views, if they see racism, say another teacher treating another pupil um, in a way which is motivated by race or ethnicity, um, they don't challenge it. Or if there is, um, you know, racist language being used in a lesson by pupils, again, those teachers aren't challenging it. So they themselves may not be racist, but by failing to challenge racism, they are allowing it to continue and to be perpetuated. Next, the liberal chauvinists. These are teachers who believe black pupils are culturally deprived and have low expectations of them. So in a sense, they are almost uh, not empathising, they're sympathising with black uh, students. They sort of look down upon them, feel sorry for them and think, well, you know, it's not their fault. They don't have any culture. You know, their parents haven't brought them up correctly. And, um, you know, it's not fair to expect that they're going to be able to achieve the same as, say, the white majority British pupils. And so, again, this is a form of racism because it is having a prejudicial view. And the way that these teachers may be acting on those views could be discriminatory. Finally, overt racists, what I like to refer to as old school racists. These are the teachers who believe blacks are inferior, but also could be Asians, minority ethnics as well, and actively discriminate against them. So they are actively going out of their way um, to be racist, although they may not necessarily use, say, racial epithets or descriptors when sort of engaging with these pupils. Their behaviour is often quite aggressive and rude, and they you know, almost undermine them and their efforts to try and achieve. Next, we're going to look at pupil identities. So Archer found that teachers construct three student identities according to a pupil's ethnicity. Firstly, the ideal pupil. Secondly, the pathologized pupil. And thirdly, the demonized pupil. And these are delineated along ethnic lines. So firstly, ideal pupils were considered to be white, middle class, have a normal sexuality, that's to say to be heterosexual and, you know, beginning to consider their own sexuality uh, with the onset of puberty between the ages of sort of 14 and 18. And these students are achieving the right way or the correct way, i.e. they work hard, they do their homework, they put their hand up in lessons, they engage in their classwork, and this is how they achieve overall. Next, you've got the pathologized pupils. These tended to be Asian. Um, they may come, from, may come from poor backgrounds, but they're seen as the deserving poor. These are the poor people who deserve your help because they want to improve their lives. Often teachers view these students as being asexual or having no uh, sexual appetite or not being interested in sex or interested in the opposite sex in any form. And they're often referred to as the plodding conformists. They're sort of quietly getting on with it, quietly conforming to the rules, quietly doing what they're told. Finally, demonized pupils. These pupils tended to be black or white working class pupils. Um, they're often seen as being hypersexualized, as being you know, overtly sexual, perhaps starting, having started puberty from a younger age. They may make um, sexual remarks in lessons or they may be um, over the top in their interest that they show towards members of the opposite sex, assuming that they are indeed heterosexual. They are often viewed as being unintelligent and again, culturally deprived. Teachers place black Asian minority ethnic pupils in identity two or three, seeing black pupils as loud, challenging and excessively sexualized while seeing Asian pupils as docile, passive and quiet. And so again, we're seeing teachers 
uh, almost with a racist mindset, place different groups of students into um, different almost subcultures and ultimately treating them differently, treating that, you know, that group one ideal pupils in a sort of very positive way, in the group two pupils, the pathologized pupils in a fairly positive but sort of, un, sort of um, sympathetic way, and finally the demonized pupils almost there's a hostility towards them, if you will. Next we're going to look at pupil responses and subcultures. Now Mary Fuller did a very famous study on black girls in a London comprehensive school in the early 80s and this was a particularly interesting group because they were untypical high achievers in high streams whereas most black girls were in low streams. But instead of internalizing negative stereotypes that perhaps that might exist in society or that teachers might be promoting or inadvertently promoting, they channeled their anger uh, at the education system and perhaps at teacher racism into their work in, and ultimately this led to educational success. They did not seek the approval of teachers uh, who they saw as racist. So whereas pupils generally who are you know, tr aiming to get the top grades or want to do their best or want to work really hard will go out of their way to make sure they have a good relationship with the teacher and seek support and you know, maybe even seek guidance and praise upon occasion. These students in fuller study weren't doing that. They were doing the complete opposite. They were eventually, essentially, sorry, um, ignoring their teachers. They maintained relationships also with lower streamed pupils. And this was also different because what often happens is when students start to do very well, they may want to mix or spend time with or do work with students like themselves, students who are working hard, aiming high. Whereas these pupils, they maintained relationships with other black girls who were perhaps underperforming. They only conformed in the sense of doing their schoolwork, but they did not conform to school rules. So they would do their work in lessons, they would hand it in on time, they would do their homework and hand that in on time, but other rules as far as they were concerned weren't there for them. So they were occasionally late, uh, they occasionally um, would break the rules with regards to school uniform. Um, they occasionally perhaps would go out of bounds during lunchtime and these sorts of things. But in terms of schoolwork, they did everything that was necessary. They relied on, this, on their own efforts and abilities to pass exams, so they were often working very hard outside of lessons. And Fuller said that this was a way of coping with the contradictory demands of the white British middle class education system, this education system which is often referred to as being ethnocentric, whilst avoiding the ridicule of black boys and maintaining relationships with black girls from lower streams. So these girls were really walking a tightrope. On one hand, the white British ethnocentric education system in the UK was making certain demands of them. At the same time, they wanted to maintain their relationships with the black girls in the lower streams. And at the same time, they didn't want black boys uh, to pick on them or to be rude to them or to bully them. So they had to walk this very careful tightrope of doing what they had to do to pass whilst at the same time maintaining those important relationships and maintaining a, a facade of respectability amongst their friends. Tony Sewell did a study looking at black boys in response to teacher racism and this was in the early 90s. He found that there were four main responses that the black boys tended to engage in uh, in response to teacher racism. Firstly there was a group known as the rebels, this was a very small minority these boys rejected the goals of education, i.e. trying to get qualifications. They rejected the rules, uh, for example, you know, wearing uniform, turning up on time. They were anti-authority. They engaged in the stereotype of being a black macho lad, of appearing to be sort of sporty and fit and strong and perhaps even um, over-sexualized. And they identified with what we might refer to as hegemonic masculinity. This is this overtly heterosexual, sexualized, form of behavior where the boys um, might say things to girls, may attempt to engage in um, relationships with girls and at the same time they want to be very competitive with other boys. The second group were known as the conformists. These were the largest groups. Um, these boys tended to accept the goals of education which was trying to get qualifications. They tended to accept the rules so they obeyed the rules and did what they were told. They were keen to succeed and they really wished to avoid the stereotype of um, the black male underachiever. They were going out of their way to try and disprove that stereotype. The next group were the retreatists. This was a very tiny minority. They were, tended to be isolated individuals. They weren't really hanging out in groups. Uh, they were disconnected from school and from the subcultures such as the rebels and the conformists. 
and in particular they tended to be despised by the rebels so these were in many ways you kind of your lonesome individuals people spend a lot of time on their own doing their own thing somewhat detached from school life somewhat detached from um you know the day-to-day -day life of their peers finally the innovators these were the second largest group they tended to be pro-education but anti-school so they wanted the qualifications and this is similar to fuller's girls from the previous study they wanted the grades they wanted to be able to go on to college or university but they didn't like schools they didn't like teachers they didn't like the rules they didn't like the uniform and sometimes they would flout those rules uh, they only conformed to schoolwork and therefore were friendly with the rebels so they were able to maintain a positive relationship if you will with the more rebellious boys next we're going to look at institutional racism when we look at institutional racism it's good to differentiate it from individual racism by institutional racism we are talking about discrimination that is built in to the way institutions such as schools and colleges operate now sometimes it can be difficult to actually see what is or is not is not institutional racism but we'll look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment uh, whereas individual racism is something which results from the prejudiced views of one individual so if you have one teacher who has racist views but all the other teachers are not racist and the school itself is going out of its way to um, be inclusive and open-minded and promote multiculturalism and equality and so on that would be an example of an individually racist person in an institution which is not racist so it's good to be able to sort of disaggregate those two things arguably the british education system is institutionally racist whereby the policies and personnel actively discriminate against ethnic minorities so it may be that schools have certain policies schools have certain um, personnel who are discriminating against ethnic minorities and hence institutional racism that said it could also be that unintentional racism is a feature of many schools so whilst the actual policies the codes of conduct the constitutions of many schools might be squeaky clean there may be no racism in there um, it might be you know, open-minded inclusive and so on there may be certain policies that are being performed or certain um, rules that are being enacted which are unintentionally racist um, furthermore we do have a lack in the UK of black Asian minority ethnic teachers you know teachers tend teaching tends to be a fairly white profession a white British profession and the lack of you know black teachers black Asian minority ethnic teachers and in particular black head teachers or principals may mean that unintentional racism that possibly is cropping up within different institutions um, isn't being rooted out isn't being uh, deleted isn't being removed isn't being replaced so again there may be a lack of black head teachers or principals and black asian minority ethnic pupils receive more negative criticism it has been argued from teachers than white students so again if most of the teachers in education tend to be white if they might be holding racist views or they might be holding um, different stereotypes or prejudiced opinions if they are lumping students into different groups and behaving or treating them uh, based on their ethnicity and perceived ability that is problematic and it could be also that white pupils are being ignored uh, or the very least are not receiving both constructive and unconstructive criticism in terms of ethnocentrism and a description of it we're talking about describing an attitude or policy that gives priority to the culture and viewpoint of one particular ethnic group while disregarding others often the focus of our education system in the uk is the activities and histories of white european christian peoples our curriculum is often referred to as being too pale male and stale i.e there's too many white people too many men and too many old people or you know stories of people from long ago in our education system perhaps it needs to be modernized perhaps it needs to become more inclusive more multicultural and perhaps we need to address the focus on men and male activities in our education system there does seem to be a lack of women and women's um, histories and women's stories in our education in particular for example history and you know considering that women make up half of our population that's something that probably needs to be challenged but of course also as we become more of a multicultural nation the stories of black asian minority ethnic britons and people from around the world this also needs to be included <laughs> 
the history of black age minority ethnic peoples and their activities and culture is often left out of education or it is included in a way which is seen as being uh, undesirable so often um, in particular in history there's lots of discussion around the British Empire or the different wars that Britain has been involved in and when black Asian minority ethnic people turn up or um, groups of people turn up in those stories they're often sub subjugated groups i.e. slaves or people who are ruled over by the British Empire and this may have a demotivating effect on black Asian minority ethnic pupils if there are no people who look and sound like you or have the same history of you or speak the same language of, as you in the, you know, in the curriculum, in the stories you're learning, in the histories you're learning, in the books you're reading, that could be demotivating. If it's just about white British people, that could um, you know, cause you to become distracted, cause you to be less interested and arguably underachieve overall. That brings us to the end of institutional racism and it also brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you.